The flowers have appeared in our land. The time of pruning is come. The vines and flower yield their sweet smell. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come. My dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the hollow places of the wall, show me thy face. Let thy voice sound in my ears, for thy voice is sweet and thy face comely. Catch us, the little foxes that destroy the vines. Words taken from the Canticle of Canticles and used for the gradual of Our Lady's Feast Day of Lourdes on February 11. St. Bernadette, as we know, heard the sweet voice of the Mother of God sound in her ears. She gazed upon her loveliness. She saw her smile in the cleft of the rock in the hollow place of the wall of Masadiel. Yet this was not the first time Our Lady came to a cave or worked out of a grotto. Here's our little bookmark we put before about these caves. When the fullness of time had come, when the Blessed Virgin Mary was to give birth to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when half spent was the night, when there was no room in the inn of Bethlehem, tradition tells us that the Holy Family resorted to a cavern-like stable for the first Christmas. The virginal birth of the Word made flesh taking place in a cave forever set the pattern for how heavenly restorations of all time are initiated. Being rejected by earthly men, heaven resorts to caves. Interesting. No wonder Our Lady chose the grotto outside of Lourdes where heavenly men, rejecting worldly ways, can find a cave of refreshment. God and His Holy Mother like to work out of caves. From his headquarters in the cavern, like stable of Bethlehem, his royal majesty sent angels to the Jewish shepherds and a miraculous star to the Gentile kings. He summoned the high and the low alike, and they all received the grace and healing. The restoration of all restorations had begun, but before long, the worldly men, that is the foxes of this world, also responded. King Herod, among the first of the foxes, sought to suppress this heavenly work by killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem and surrounding area, hoping to destroy the newborn king and his promised restoration in its infancy. Like the demons in the river Gav, he was saying in his own way, Get out of here. Get out of here. This is my kingdom. Later, the religious authorities, namely Annas and Caiaphas, and that other Herod, whom our Lord and Savior called the Vixen, he tried to outfox the restoration by putting the Savior to a most undeserved and cruel death through Pontius Pilate. Yet as we all believe and know, his dead body, still united to the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, was laid to rest in the virginal tomb, a crypt, on Good Friday. And lo and behold, we know what happened. The heavenly repairs started anew with His Majesty's glorious resurrection on the first day of the week. And this time, it was unstoppable. Heaven resorting to caves, Grace and healing flowing therefrom. Hmm, what's going on here? Consider a few more examples. King David fled to a cave in his flight from the diabolically possessed King Saul. We read in the first book of Kings, all that were in distress and oppressed with debt. Sound familiar? And oppressed with debt and under affliction of mind gathered themselves unto David in the cave of Odalam. And he became their prince, and there were with him about 400 men. From that grotto of Odalam, King David slowly worked, but surely worked, to restore the promised land to God's chosen people. 
The prophet Saint Elias, Elijah by some translations using the Hebrew, fought very hard to overcome all that offended God under King Achab and his cunningly evil queen Jezebel, only to be sent fleeing to a cleft in the rock on Mount Horeb, but from thence being carefully instructed by God's gentle voice in a breeze, probably not unlike the breeze that St. Bernadette heard on the 11th of February, St. Elias was able from that breeze in that cleft to start a restoration movement. Some would even hold that he started the Carmelite order itself that continues even after he himself was taken up in a fiery chariot. The prophet Jeremiah took the most holy things of the Hebrew temple, namely the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, and the old Mosaic tabernacle, and he hid them in a cavern on Mount Nebo. Just prior to the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonian infidels. Yet this very same Ark will someday be found again with the return of St. Elias, he's not dead yet. He's waiting to come back. So St. Elias will come back. And from that finding of the ark, from the very cave where it's located, the Jews will convert all mass to Christ. The one true church and be saved from the grip of the Antichrist. And then it's the end. In a sense, the world is waiting for the conversion of the Jews. When they convert, time comes to an end. The Lord comes, the Antichrist dies. Well, the same story of grottoes, caves, crypts, caverns, as a place of divine refuge, restoration, grace, conversion, and healing is repeated over and over again down through the ages. Rome was conquered through the faithful Christians working out of the catacombs. St. Anthony of the desert and many other desert fathers fled the luxury of the world to live in holes in the ground from which they started a monastic movement that would preserve the church in the darkest days ahead. St. Benedict, the father of Western monasticism, fled opulent Rome and lived in a little cavern called Subiaco. Coming forth from this earthen shelter, he laid the foundations for 12 monasteries, 12 foundation stones for Western culture. St. Benedict is one of the founding fathers of Europe. It all began in a grotto. The 8th century Spain, very important right now to be thinking about this, 8th century Spain was all but lost to the Muslim Moors, except for a few hundred faithful Catholics taking refuge in a cavern of Our Lady in the northern part of Spain called Covadonga. From that hollow place, they began, with the help of the majestic Queen of Queens, to repel the infidel Muslims and ultimately cast them out 770 years later. It began in the cave. Coincidentally, the castle in Lourdes, very close to the grotto, was the last holdout for the Muslims in southern France. Charles Martel kicked them all out, and that was the last holdout, Lourdes, France. Interesting. Although many, many more examples could be provided, we can now see why Our Lady came to Lourdes and appeared to St. Bernadette from the grotto of Masabiel, and why this is a good mission theme, huh? Heavenly restorations, grace and healing of whole nations often begin with and flow from caves. This means Lord's is a safe place to be looking for heavenly grace, healing, and restoration. Now, not surprisingly, just like our Lord, many foxes have tried to suppress the Immaculate Virgin's counter-revolution and efforts of restoration. At Lourdes, she came to undo the evil effects of the Enlightenment upon France and the world. And as we have heard, hell fought back mightily and failed miserably, making a din in the waters of the River Gough, threatening St. Bernadette to get out of here or else. Officials from both the church and the state tried in a variety of ways either to ignore or silence the heavenly counterattack emanating from the niche in the wall 
and from its sacred spring. All their feeble efforts proved to no avail. Each and every one of them were countered and forced to bow down, as we've mentioned, and accept the sweet commands of this heavenly queen. Even as the 15 days were progressing, Abbe Parramel, the dean of Lourdes, noticed the increase in the number of confessions, as well as the increase in virtue of his people. It was as if Our Lady were conducting her own kind of mission. He was impressed. He was starting to think there's something really going on here that's worth looking into. Since then, we know well that millions upon millions upon millions have found their spiritual, mental, physical health restored by making pilgrimage to Lourdes, by washing in and drinking of its waters, by going to confession, kissing the ground and praying the rosary. And that is what I want for you too. Once again, all that is needed for our well-being, our healing, our perfection of spirit, soul, and body is contained, seems to me, at least in kernel form, in the apparitions of Lourdes, is contained in the 15 days, in the 15 mysteries of the rosary, which they represent. And it is piety, piety, piety that makes us take full advantage of them. And Bernadette's incorrupt body stands as a proof that this is true. Yes, the divine stage then seems to be set. It is the cave versus the river. The lady versus the devil, the world and the flesh. And in between, there is Bernadette kneeling down and all who are willing to kneel down along with her, willing to look at the lady, not take our eyes off of her. All of those who are willing to kneel down and do penance, penance, penance. Once the visionary Bernadette was asked about her behavior during the rapture. And so she was asked, why are you happy one minute and sad the next? Because they would watch her face because it reflected the lady. And so she responded piously, Oh, I'm sad when she is sad. And I smile when she smiles. That's piety, folks. Piety is trying to see things as God sees them, as his mother sees them, and to do the same. I want to think like God. I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to see things as God sees them. I want to see things as the lady sees them. What do we do now? God, you think like me. I want you to see things as I see them. That's what we're doing to God. And that's impiety. It's killing us. Well, this little seer said, I'm sad when she's sad. I smile when she smiles. The little seer never forgot the look of sadness on the lady's heavenly face, such as the time she asked on the seventh day of the 15 days, the day that corresponds to the scourging at the pillar. On that day, fittingly on that mystery, the Blessed Mother said, penance, penance, penance. Pray for the conversion of sinners. That was the message. The Heavenly Queen asked most sweetly if Bernadette might not get down on her knees and kiss the ground as a penance for sinners. The lady's face was so sad, Bernadette said, she would do this with all her heart. If you want me to kiss the ground, no problem, mother. Boom, she's on the ground. This is piety that we should want too. That which makes even difficult things a delightful service. Where there is love, there's no labor. But what about that threefold request for penance? Is that just kissing the ground for sinners? At Fatima, the angel depicted in the vision of the third part of the secret, repeated the same threefold request of Our Lady of Lords. Remember, he has a flaming sword and he says, penance, penance, penance. With this penance performed, in the vision it's shown that the heavenly queen was depicted as putting out the flames of God's wrath coming upon the world. It's a very powerful image. If we do our part, she can do her part. 
We must cooperate then. We must do our part to end the wrath that is upon us. Unfortunately, I know some people that are like this. They want it to come even worse than ever. Come on, bring it on. Maybe there's some truth to that, but you know, that's not how we are supposed to think. We're supposed to be like Our Lady, trying to hold up the arm of God, trying to prevent the wrath. For we know not what we want if we want that wrath to come. Can we endure it? Will we survive it spiritually? Don't be presumptuous and think, oh yeah, I can handle it, I'm ready. Oh, really? We should be like Our Lady trying to put out the flames and save souls, lest they be lost in the conflagration. But what is this penance that heaven is asking of us? What is preferred by heaven? To clarify this request for penitence, His Majesty later came to Sister Lucia and he said, the sacrifice required for every person is the fulfillment of his duties in life and the observance of my law. This is the penance that I now seek and require. What penance am I asking for? That you do your duties of your state in life. Now, it seems to me that with a detailed examination of conscience, such as the one we provide for this mission, most are able to identify their sins, their infractions of the law with some accuracy, but not readily their duties. Our Lord's command to observe His law covers both the natural and divine law, namely the Ten Commandments and the six precepts and the church's explication of them. Find them in the Catechism. These laws show the boundary lines between the love of God and the love of self. If you love me, our Lord said, keep my commandments. If you love yourself, you're not going to keep them. So these laws show us where love of God and love of self begin. These are the laws they provide us the lines between life and death. Our Lord said elsewhere, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. This is the difference between life and death. That's the borderline. Again, the usual infractions of these are listed in a good examination of conscience. Such an examination provides what sort of things we fall into when we fail to fulfill our duties. Yet few, including myself, seem able to map out the duties owed to God and to neighbors so that they fully embrace the request of our sweet heavenly queen to do penance Penance, penance. In other words, to know our duties and to keep them is the same as staying in our cave alongside Bernadette and all the saints. That is what our cave is, folks. It's our vocation in life and all its obligations and responsibilities. I hope you've already noticed one of the themes of this mission is to provide some basic understanding of our duties as faithful, pious Catholics. Every effort is being made to impart the principles we need to map out these duties so that we will complete our penance for you to cooperate with the lady in putting out the flames and become a saint in the process. Thus, on the first night, we contemplated the end of man. We covered our duty toward the poor souls in purgatory, gaining indulgences for them and having masses offered for them. The sixth decade of the rosary for them. We also talked about our duty to avoid going there ourselves. Thus, we wear the brown scapular. We give alms. We seek to be saints with purgatory as the safety net. On the second night, last night, we learned the most grave duty to love the church and Our Lady, her perfect type and image, all the while resisting error, regardless of where it comes from, even if it comes from someone, God forbid, inside the citadel of God itself, even from the highest levels, which has happened at various times before. We've had Pope John the 22nd who spoke in error multiple times from the pulpit, caused a huge division in the Dominicans and other places. Thus, we have an obligation at this time to study and deepen our faith. We're obliged. We can't help but do this if we're going to survive. 
We have to love all things traditional, to deepen our devotion to Blessed Mary, to renew our baptismal vows frequently and not be afraid to be Catholics, even to seek the conversion of others in this dark night. We spoke about those last night. In the next two conferences, we will cover our duties to discern the spirits tomorrow night, especially private revelation. And those obligations owed to God in the most blessed of sacraments on the last night. We'll talk about miracles. Some of the most awesome miracles at Lourdes. One thing is certain, however, we have no duty whatsoever to leave the church. We have no duty to do that. I don't care who's in charge. I don't care what they do. I'm not leaving the church. And that's the way it should be. We have no duty to leave the church. That would be to listen to the voices of the river to get out of this place, to get out of this cave. To prevent this from happening, let us keep our eyes on Our Lady ever victorious and she will help us to know and fulfill our obligations while preventing us from drinking of that foul river. If you know the story of Lourdes, you'll know that she did prevent this for St. Bernadette. We'll talk about that in a moment. And she will do it for us too. So tonight, we've reached, as it were, the heart of the mission, as is fitting. This is the middle conference. Although it may not seem so, we need to grasp something of our duties. This is the heart. How we're going to do this penance, penance, penance. To map out, as it were, the inner courts of our place in the city of God. To know our cave. Spending most of our time considering our duties in general in order to learn the principles of piety. Underlying all of our responsibilities. Knowing the principles will help us to map out each part with some accuracy and with some understanding. This is our goal. As we proceed, we can briefly consider a few examples in particular. Besides, the more we work on drawing out the map ourselves... And trying to reflect on these things, the more we'll appreciate them and seek to fulfill them. Also, various summaries of the duties of husbands and fathers, wives and mothers, children, and Christians in general has been provided in the back of the church. I encourage you to take a copy home with you, especially those that pertain to you. Now, you should brace yourself for when you read those, they're on the ideal level They're to help you love your cave. You're not going to be able to reach those things overnight. We need to strive for it. I don't want to put you on a guilt complex either. So don't feel like I'm trying to. Look, the priest has whole books dedicated to his duties and obligations. Here's one by St. John Hughes. These things put us on our knees. Are we going to fulfill this overnight? No, but we work at it. It's the same with those things in the back of the church. Brace yourself when you read it, but say, I'm going to do this the best I can. Start working at it. There's other things that could be mentioned in those. They're not present, but they're a good start. They're not a definitive explanation of all your duties. It's trying to get you to think in terms of what God wants for you. So please take a copy home with you. But let us make sure we're properly motivated. Why should I do this? I tell you, it's powerful. The duties of our state in life are things that keep us under the umbrella of God's grace. They keep us in our cave. They provide what we should be doing inside the boundaries marked by God's law. Fulfilling our responsibilities is like being undercover in a toxic storm. We're protected. What is more, those who strive to perform them well find that they just don't have much time to sin. I tell you what, when a priest does everything he's supposed to be doing, he just doesn't have time to sin. Instead, they spend their life trying to do what? Please God, smile when she smiles and sad when she's sad. That's what we should be doing. That is a sort of definition of a saint. Someone who spent his life pleasing God. Those who do what they're supposed to be doing when they're supposed to be doing it do not easily give way to temptations and they become more and more holy even despite themselves. There is rarely any purgatory for one who perseveres in such a life. 
We heard it on Sunday night. John Vianney talked about two people who went straight to heaven. Those two people fulfilled their duties regularly. That's why they went straight to heaven. When Bernadette knelt down to pray, even in the mud, on one Sunday, God protected her from harm, not allowing her Sunday best dress. She still had to go to the high mass. She had her best Sunday dress, and it wasn't soiled at all in the grimy, muddy grotto that morning. Her lips got mud on them, and her hands got mud. Nothing else got mud. Why is that? He did not allow her hand to be burned by the candle she piously held in her hand. Why? Because she was under the umbrella of God's protection. When all the world and underworld arrayed itself against her, she could stay the course and not get soiled, not be burned. That's awesome. He promises you that too. When people came to confession to St. John the Baptist, standing in the Jordan all day long, how did he do that? You try standing in water all day long. How do you do that? You don't. He did because that was his duty and God protected him. How did John Vianney spend 18 hours at times in confession without dying? When you do your job, he'll do his part. When he was standing in the Jordan, he piously instructed them to stay and work within the boundary of their duties, those who came to him. Thus, in the gospel, we hear these words. The publicans also came to be baptized and said to him, Master, what shall we do? But he said to them, Do nothing more than that which is appointed to you. Interesting. And the soldiers also asked him, saying, well, What shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither calumniate any man, and be content with your pay. So knowing his boundaries, St. John Vianney often sent penitents back to their own pastors for the solutions they required. I'm not the right person for this. You need to go back to your pastor. St. Bernadette sent them to the grotto and it's spring. In fact, she was repulsed by anyone seeking a cure from her. What is more, she always kept to what she knew in answering the endless questions about the apparitions, all the while remaining her st- maintaining her secrets. They're always trying to poke at her to get them out of her. People were going outside of the proper limits with her all the time. They violated many virtues in trying to get her to speak of something they had no business knowing. They tried to treat her like a saint at one moment. Other times they probed, they had no business. No wonder Our Lady said, I promise you happiness in the next, but not in this life. We cause others pain when we violate our limits. Well, because of this fidelity to duty, when that host of devils came to attack the girl Bernadette, she did not have to do very much at all, but just stay focused on the lady. She did it all for her. I don't know about you, I'd rather have our lady take care of the devils than me to take care of them. She just needs to look at them, one sovereign look, and they're gone. They're packing. They're gone with a headache. When Bernadette tried to drink of the river Gav, mistakenly thinking it was what the virgin desired, she was going to drink of that foul river where the devil was from. What happened? Our lady said, no, no, don't go there. Come over here. She prevented it. She wouldn't allow her to go outside of her boundaries. So when being threatened with jail time, St. Bernadette responded, "Ah, I fear nothing because I've always told the truth. She would even mock the jailers. You better tie me up tight and hold me in. So I'm going to get away. Little girl speaking to officials. That's amazing. God is faithful. If we remain faithful, he will not abandon us. Bernadette had been faithful to her commission and God was faithful to her all the way to the end. And today, as we know, she is very beautiful and incorrupt. How very often people today get angry and frustrated Why this anger? Why this frustration? So many try to fix things and all their efforts fail. We have all these blogs. They got the answer to everything. They know. They got these insights that you're supposed to watch and check in on. They know how to solve all the church's problems. Why this failure? These people are angry, by the way. You ever notice that? A lot of them are angry, use foul language. 
Because they're outside of their caves. They're doing things that are outside of their boundaries. They've extended their duties beyond their limits and have come out from under the umbrella of grace. This is not part of God's plan for them. I'm not talking just about bloggers. I'm talking about anybody who gets angry and frustrated. When you find yourself getting angry and frustrated, chances are you're outside of your boundaries. There's no grace out there and you're in for it. And God's letting you feel it. You've left the boundary layer. Get back in here. Not surprisingly, when you get out there, you start hearing voices sound. Give it up. Get out of there. Get out. Leave. Can't do it. What's the use? Oh, how tempting it is to run away when we're angry and frustrated or have failed to pull back and hide somewhere and leave off our responsibilities and replace them with things we like. I don't like those people anymore. I'll find somebody I like. Many priests have left the priesthood. The religious lay aside their habits and rule books and leave their convents. Married couples divorce. Children run away. They all end up what? Drinking deeply from that river and do many things that are not pleasing to God. The message is plain. Know your place. Know your cave. Stay in your cave, come what may, because when we leave off performing our duties, we put ourselves within reach of the floodwaters flowing from the devil's mouth, and oh, how easily it is to take a drink. And at first, it tastes pretty sweet. Tasty. We're carried away and drowned in those very enticing waters. As you are most likely fully aware, there have been many drowning victims. We can count them among our relatives. Our duties of our state, therefore, are precious. They're valuable. Know them. Love them. Get down in your cave and kiss it. Thank God for my cave. Help me love it. If you don't, start praying to. Lord, help me love my vocation. Help me love this cave. I don't want to ever leave. The cave shows us where God's umbrella of grace is located. The desert fathers living in caves gave this simple counsel. Don't leave your cave. Don't leave your cave. Don't leave your cave. Stay inside. And not surprisingly, the devil did all he could to get them out. Get out of there. Again, as the third secret of Fatima shows, when we do our penance by staying put in our grotto, Our Lady extinguishes the flames of God's wrath coming down upon the world. Fulfilling our responsibilities, therefore, preserves life, saves souls. Wow. Now, perhaps the easiest way to view our duties is in terms of the cross. Our duties are twofold. Those owed to God and those owed to our neighbor. Vertical, owed to God. Horizontal, owed to our neighbor. Coming together to form the cross. Jesus said, take up your cross. We take up our cross. Blessed Francis Palau is a little more specific. He says, acts of piety are frequency of the sacraments, assistance in the celebrations of worship, observance of the precepts of the law, listening to the word of God, spiritual reading, prayers and supplication, almsgiving, visiting the sick, etc. Maybe we could add on to spiritual and corporeal works of mercies when they present themselves. Now, in regards to keeping within these duties owed to God, it seems to me that Our Lady provided the best way when she said to Sister Lucia, I promise to assist at the hour of death with graces necessary for salvation. All those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite the rosary, keep me company for a quarter of an hour while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary with the intention of making reparation to my Immaculate Heart. Quotation, Our Lady of Fatima. This, in a sense, is a little plan that we should apply to our daily life and our weekly life. Here's a sort of plan of life provided by heaven. We should strive to attend Mass more than once a week. We should go to confession about every two weeks, at least every 16 days. Each day, spend at least 15 minutes in meditation in addition to devoutly reciting the Holy Rosary every day. 
Doing so with the intention of making reparation pleases God and his mother and keeps us safe in the cave. Remember, authentic godliness wants to go beyond what is required, not to be a minimalist. It doesn't want to double up either. If you're going to pray the rosary, I'm not opposed to praying the rosary when you're driving down the road, but that shouldn't be your only rosary. You should have some time in your life dedicated to kneeling down and saying the rosary with devotion. And then you can say the other two rosaries when you're driving or whatever. There should be no rushing through the rosary, but devoutly reciting it at a dedicated time. Stay faithful to this, and we will be doing well on the vertical. Now, those duties of the horizontal bar are arranged carefully in a hierarchy. This is extremely important, meaning that certain things must be fulfilled before others. After we love and serve God and His church, we next seek the good of our family, relatives, friends, and co workers in that order. Even in the family, duties are fulfilled in a certain order. For example, a father must first take care of his wife and family before all else. She must take care of him before all else. I've seen fathers gone a lot working on all these works of mercy for the church. Meanwhile, wife and children are home alone. That's not right. Leave that work to some older gentleman whose children are grown and left the house. Your job is to be at home. Each of these duties demands the practice of certain virtues. And the handouts, I believe, explain these things. Maybe something that's not mentioned I want to mention is that it's very helpful if parents give memories to their children. Parents, if I could tell you one thing, this is what I'd tell you. Work hard at giving your children good, healthy memories. Because if they go astray, if they drink from that water, from that river, the memory will be how God brings them back. They'll remember what a peaceful life they had and how wrong they were to leave it. Give them good memories and you'll be doing well. So we got the vertical, that's for God. Horizontal, that's for neighbor. Put them together, we got the cross. Now, in the time remaining, I think it's important that we review some principles, some tools that are very useful in knowing and embracing these duties, even unto perfection, and what attacks them. And this, once again, we're going to use piety. Godliness comes to our aid by always wanting to go the extra mile and make sure we do our part, to make sure we remain in the cave, under the umbrella, seeking to please our Lord and King and His Blessed Mother. So let's look through four or five things. Here we go. Number one, again, piety is never satisfied with less. In other words, it resists sloppiness, minimalism. Think of how St. Bernadette made the sign of the cross very carefully and devoutly. Again, when we do our duties well, we will not have time to sin. When you put yourself into serving God, you do it well, you just won't have time to do those sinful things. History has shown that too much leisure time destroys souls, divides families, and corrupts whole nations. Perhaps seeing the difference between entertainment and recreation can really help us out. Entertainment versus recreation. Parents need to provide recreation. They need to provide some healthy diversions for their children. But I'm not so sure they need to entertain their children. That's where the danger comes. Entertainment is basically what feeds our senses, our eyes, our ears. And often excites the passions, whereas recreation refreshes the body and the mind and renews us so that we can once again take up our duties with vigor. Entertainment includes things like, you probably guessed it, things like movies and video games, which rarely, if ever, increase our piety. There's probably some good, pious movies out there, of course. But you know what? There's not much merit in watching a movie. It's better to be with your family and play games and do things that are recreative, going for walks, 
building something together or something like that. It's very meritorious. Builds relationships. Watching a movie doesn't build relationships. As far as I know, there's no indulgences for watching a movie. They usually just keep us from our duties. And I tell you, most parents know this. If they have a TV or a movie or something, they find that a lot of the contention in the family flows from that. I can remember when I was growing up, most of our family feuds took place around the TV. Us kids would get in these big fights on who was going to watch what and when and where. We need to provide healthy diversions so that we can return to fulfilling our duties with vigor. Seek recreation, not entertainment. In order to maintain the proper boundaries, piety enjoys hearing or reading about how the forefathers did things, thereby loving all things traditional. So the second thing about piety is that when pious souls hear how things used to be, it perks up and wants to do the same even now. It doesn't need to understand every reason why they did that. It just knows that this is what my forefathers did and it must have been good and I want to do it too. If they did these things, let's try it out. If they wore chapel veils of old, then piety wants to wear one now. Maybe they don't know all the reasons why, but they did it before. I want to do it now. That's piety speaking. If they always genuflected when crossing in front of the Blessed Sacrament, they want to do it again. They want to do it now. If they dressed up especially for Mass on Sunday, it's piety that moves us to do so again. Thus, we must study and know the faith most especially from the lives of the saints and from our beloved ancestors. Let us then always be reading the lives of the saints and studying history. I tell you, this is one of the problems in religious life. When these young people get into these religious communities and they see how the men are living now and they start to read about what they used to do and they try to start doing those things again because they did it and I want to do it. If they did it, I want to do it. And then pretty soon they go out the door. Not allowed to be pious now. Furthermore, perhaps most importantly, piety always seeks to maintain verticality and performing duties. It admires what is above it and what went before it so that pious souls can participate in the goodness found there. So it's looking up, trying to get higher itself. It admires what is superior in order to become superior over itself. As a result, godliness always recognizes a hierarchy. This is very important. It always recognizes a hierarchy and wants to do what is pleasing to those above, ultimately to please God himself in doing so. So the pious soul recognizes the supreme place of Christ's holy church and of Christ's holy mother, of the clergy, of parents, anyone that God has placed, and here is a key line, or allowed, allowed to be placed in a superior position. Piety admires their place in the position of God's world without having to admire the person holding the position. I can admire the office without admiring the office holder. More on that in a moment. So piety always seeks to maintain verticality, not bring them down to my level or stand over them and ridicule them. That's an inversion. That'll kill piety. Fourth of all, this all makes piety self-effacing, moving the pious soul to fulfill the rights of God and those of a superior before its own. If it's hierarchical, i got to do what they want before I do what I want. It does not look for a higher position or force itself upon others or offer unwarranted advice or undue counsel. It does not do things for show. That would be pietism and religiosity. All these are out of due order. Again, we know when we have overreached our God-given duties, how do we know it? How do we know when we've gone beyond what we're supposed to be doing? We get angry. We get frustrated. We feel temptations to flee. Come out from under the umbrella. Look at your life. Find out the times you're angry. Trace them back and you'll find out you stepped across the line somewhere. In any case, this makes godliness the backbone 
of our spiritual life, keeping it standing upright and able to look up at God at all times, in all places, able to see his presence. Something the saints are able to do. Now, Bernadette's little brother recounts a simple little story just to give an idea of this. One day when I went to bed too early, intending to say my prayers lazily in bed, Bernadette forced me to get up and pray properly. That's piety. That's verticality. Get out of that bed. Don't pray like that. Kneel down. True piety does not allow any slouching. It keeps self-love at bay. It makes us look up. Now, given these few basics, we can now see what hurts or upsets our godliness. Such that our piety is tempted to leave off its duties. We lose our piety. When that happens, the soul will experience anger, frustration, and temptation. All right. What's the first thing that upsets piety? Egalitarianism. Ugh. Egalitarianism. What's that? That's a fancy word that means basically there's no hierarchy. Came out of the French Revolution. All is flat. All is equal. All is level. Which in turn leads to treating those in position of superior as equal. Or it can be like this. Superiors insisting on being treated like everybody else. A simple definition of humility is knowing your place and taking your place. False humility is stepping out of your proper place. Stepping out of your cave. And that upsets piety. Unwilling to wear the proper dress. Do the proper actions of your office and your state. That upsets the piety of the people. Egalitarianism is an effect of false humility. In any case, whenever there's a flattening of hierarchy, godliness suffers. Things such as priests and religious dropping their titles. Just call me Bob. How about wearing lay clothes? Walking around without any sign that they're religious. How about the building of flat, round churches as places of worship? Does that make our piety inspire it in any way, build it up? Absolutely not. The use of common or vulgar language by someone consecrated to God. The use of profane music, art, and actions along with the sacred. Religious performing on stage, rock and roll, and all kinds of stuff from that river. And so on and so on. When a faithful, pious soul is confronted with that, sees it and hears it, it becomes confused. It becomes unrestful. What's going on? It becomes disoriented. Why? Because piety is under attack. That's it. That's the reason. Verticality is lost. Now, as we've noted, true piety enables the soul to see God behind each and every level of hierarchy in the world. The structure of the universe. This surely is one reason we've said that it's called godliness. I see God here, 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 here. I see how he's working. It sees him in heaven, on earth, standing behind the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops and priests, each in their proper place. It sees him in our parents and those of our family above us, our big brothers and sisters and our teachers and in the leaders of our country even. Piety worships God, as it were, standing behind all of these people, these positions. I'm not worshiping those people. I'm worshiping God behind them. Honoring you, therefore, because of that. So in this way, godliness enables us to fulfill our duty to honor each of them according to their place and treat them with respect due to that position regardless of their personal worth. Americans don't like hearing that. When we see a president we don't like, we feel like we can open fire. 
As a youth, St. Bernadette was at times sent to a nearby town to live with a wet nurse in order to recover her health. As it turns out, she was not always treated well by this woman. When discovered much later, she was asked, well, why didn't you tell your father who loved her very deeply? He would go there and see her all the time. They were very close. She rightly and piously responded, oh, no, no. I thought it was the good Lord's will. When we think the good Lord allows it, we don't complain. Clearly, any flattening, disorientation, or inversion of God's hierarchical order built into the very fabric of the universe upsets or even destroys our sense of godliness. When that happens, sins will multiply on the earth. And since this disorientation is everywhere present at this time, we're seeing an explosion of sinning, even of the most perverse kinds. There's little fear of God left in man. We're also seeing a diminishing and a ridiculing of all things pious and godly. Let us therefore not give way to any egalitarianism. Do not join in with those who put themselves over their superiors. Now the second thing that upsets piety is personalism. Hmm, interesting, huh? Personalism. Again, a fancy word that basically means that we start with the human person in regards to everything. Man is the centerpiece, the focus. Personalism dictates that we somehow have a personal connection, that we have to make a personal connection to a superior. Whether it be our older sibling, a parent, a godparent, a teacher, a priest, a bishop, or even a pope or even various leaders of our state, governors, senators, presidents. If this personal connection is lacking, if we do not like them, how quickly we fail in virtue toward them. Have we not heard many things like, my older brothers, they were mean to me. My parents did this wrong or failed in doing that right. I'm leaving this family. Going back to that family reunion. I'm not doing all that. No way. I'm done with those people. Or how about this? This priest, that nun, that bishop, that pope, they're not very holy. Saying and doing things that clearly harm the church. I'm leaving the church. I left the church because I couldn't get along with that priest. I left the church because I couldn't get along with that nun. She gave me the ruler when I was in school. I'm sick of it. People use that. Sad to say they become their own church. Sometimes and they crown themselves as popes. The only person they really like is themselves. Two things seem to be happening at this time due to the presence of this egalitarianism and this personalism. Okay, two things. One, if a truly pious person keeping to his own boundaries tries to resist in a lawful manner the impiety of a superior or a prelate, he is often considered to have attacked the very person of the superior. You ever notice that? It seems everything is considered personal now. He's simply trying to correct an error without touching the person, and he's been told, you're attacking him. No, I'm not. Simply trying to teach the truth. All is subjective now. Priests, for example, have an obligation to teach the truth, come what may, even to the shedding of their blood. Once again, you have these books on these duties of the priest. They put you on your knees. In a way, they take their life in their hands each time they get into the pulpit. It's a grave obligation. But sad to say, by merely presenting the faith as it's been given to us, as it's always been presented, many priests have been censured, corrected, even by lay folk, for being against some superior prelate. I've been pulled aside multiple times. You're against this person. What are you talking about? I'm simply trying to give you the truth. I didn't attack that person. When in reality, I'm simply making needed clarification or an explanation to keep the flock from falling into error. Again, it seems everything is considered personal now. You think about it in the old days. There were previous times when the prelates and rulers wanted such stalwart servants like these critical people near hand near to them and ready to tell them, you're not doing that right. 
to help them stay on track and make good decisions. Now they're sent away seen as personal enemies. That's a loss of piety. That's what that is. Cannot see God at work. They've reduced everything down to the human person. Second, others failing to make a personal connection with the superior, and I think the bloggers come in very strong here, failing to make a personal connection with the superior will hold them in disdain and even openly attack and spurn them. Since this or that superior is not to their liking, they vocalize their complaints and blame all things wrong in their life on those miserable people. Many children today blame their parents for all their problems. Many parents blame some priest, past or present, for their problems or openly attack them in front of their children. This too is impiety. It's a disease of our days. True godliness, as we have noted, is able to see God behind every superior, even if they're wicked. Somehow God allowed this man to be here at this time for a reason. I'm going to respect the office. St. Gerard Magella was working as an apprentice tailor. He was regularly beaten by his master tailor in front of all his peers for no good reason. The saint would sit there and smile under the blows. Asked later how he could do such a thing, he said that he saw the hand of God behind the whole affair. This is piety at work. It's at its best. St. Bernadette, remember what she said? When we think the good Lord allows it, we don't complain. He allowed it. It wouldn't have happened if he didn't. If this is godliness... It is godliness that enables us to maintain our verticality and not lose sight of our end. Not allowing any human being to get between us and and God. Between ourselves and the heavenly laid in the niche. So no matter how bad a prelate, a parent, a superior be, true piety demands we give them honor due to their place. That's hard. Now you know why our Lord said, Penance, penance, penance. King David had multiple opportunities to dethrone the wicked Saul. He was a man possessed by the devil. He was rejected by God. Wow. A man who tried over and over to kill David. Yet King David would not touch the Lord's anointed and would hear nobody speak evil of him. He rightly left him to God. Again, Sister Lucia of Fatima said, It is necessary not to let yourself be drawn away by the doctrines of disoriented contradictors. The campaign is diabolical, she said. We need to confront it without getting into conflicts. And that's what we're doing. And I think she says not getting into conflicts, personal conflicts is what she means. Our Lady seems to send this message wherever she goes, folks. At Lourdes, she insisted that Bernadette approach the priest to ask for a chapel, that it be built. Go to the priest, go to the priest, and ask that a chapel be built, and that processions come here. They resisted. They belittled her. But Bernadette always honored them. Always. When Our Lady wanted a chapel built on Tepeyac, outside of Mexico, she sent Juan Diego to the bishop. In this case, too, the prelate was difficult to deal with. This is highly significant. It is one of the hallmarks of a true voice of heaven. It demands that the hierarchy of the church, the bishops, and the priests be treated with due honor, come what may. Juan Diego, the bishop won't listen to you. Build your own chapel, Juan Diego. She didn't say that. Go back. Go back. Work with him. When St. Mary Major was built in Rome, it was to Pope Liberius, died in 366, that a wealthy and childless couple had to resort to build her shrine. Now, if you know anything about Pope Liberius, he was the 35th after St. Peter, and he's the first not to be canonized a saint. It seems he participated in a vaguely worded excommunication of St. Athanasius under the intense pressure after returning from a forced exile. 
Yet Our Lady also gave him, along with the wealthy couple, a dream of where to build her basilica. Now, how many today would have nothing to do with such a pope? Our Lady thought otherwise. Pope Pius XII calls the St. Mary Major the Liberian Basilica. Here is a very important lesson for piety. Authority is from God regardless of the goodness or sinfulness of the prelate. Pilate, Annas, Caiaphas had no faith, no true piety. Yet our Lord himself recognized that they possessed God's authority. Authority even in a sense to put him, the son of God, to death. He allowed him to. And he always respected them in the proper way. He answered Pilate when it came for the proper things. He would answer him. Piety does not set upon the virtue of a prelate or superior, but rather his place in the hierarchy of God. Piety tells us that this is superior. This man is the superior. Despite his weakness and even malice, he is the superior, able to make judgments and give commands on God's behalf unless they be sinful Within his given boundaries, he has that power. Is it not true that a priest in mortal sin or a priest without any faith at all, God forbid, can still consecrate? Yes, he can still consecrate the sacred host. He can still give absolution to confessional. Yes, God can still work through him. And we would go to confession to him if he was all the priest we had. Only when the prelate or superior goes outside of his boundaries by openly and plainly teaching something false or doing something sinful are we called, even duty-bound, to resist him as is fitting to our own station in the church. For example, parents, when hearing something incorrect from a priest or from another family member, should make careful corrections to their children as is required to preserve their faith and morals, all the while attempting to cover the nakedness of the superior, as Shem did to Noah. By avoiding any personal attacks in this way, true piety makes us resolve to respect our superiors whenever thinking of them, dealing with them, speaking about them, or even conversing with them, regardless, once again, of their personal worth or dispositions. Furthermore, we must do as Bernadette was commanded. Seek permission in all matters pertaining to their office and position. And our godliness will be preserved. We will be blessed. Verticality will be maintained. Thus, Blessed Francis Palau states, You owe love, gratitude, and honor, not only to God, but also to your parents, your teachers, and all your superiors. Have you paid this tribute? Do you pay it now? Examine it well, for if you have debts, you will not enter heaven until you have paid them all. Truly, this is among the hardest duties in life to fulfill. Penance, penance, penance. I encourage you to take one of those sheets home with you. Let us once again summarize. Let us flee from the flooding river of doubt impiety, rationalism, egalitarianism, personalism, which tries to level and invert God's created order. We must avoid becoming bad Catholics. Now, here's some things we can do as dutiful and pious Catholics. We mentioned tonight, strive to stay in your cave. Come what may. By mapping out your duties owed to God and to man, piously fulfilling them. This will require we study our faith and its obligations. Again, there's some handouts available in the back of the church. Number two, maintain honor and respect due to those in positions of authority, regardless of our personal like or dislike for them. St. Paul says, Let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but from God, and those that are, are ordained by God. Therefore, he that resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist purchase to themselves damnation. Wow. Romans chapter 13. Bernadette always sought permission from her parents. 
Bernadette went to the priest. David left the wicked Saul to God. Number three, finally, stay focused on the lady in the niche, the hollow place of the wall, by fulfilling the first Saturday devotions and making them more relevant even to daily life. Consecrate yourself and everything you own to her and she will help you overcome all the foxes and the voices that are coming from the river, voices of egalitarianism, rationalism, and excessive personalism. Would you do me the kindness of coming two more nights? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.